the frequency and the vibration of this God that they're looking for, this master builder, because he's one of the dragons. There's two dragons, a double dragon, right? God's a dragon and Satan's a dragon and they're twins. You know, it's a splitting of, of maybe an original dragon, two dragons, they're twins. Hey, everybody, tune in to Recent Tartarian. Recent Tartarian. Recent Tartarian. Hey, bro. What's up with you? How you been? Been doing well. How you been? Dude. So everybody, this is giant, by the way. Well, I know you're in California right now. What have you been, what have you been up to recently? Uh, a little bit of everything. I'm, I'm on the homestead. We're, uh, we're building the infrastructure, uh, lots of chickens, lots of gardening, uh, solar, the whole shebang, trying to live self-sustainable. So we're not dependent. Right. That's crazy. I know you just got back from also driving across the country. I mean, like you've seen a lot of America right now. What do you, what do you think is so uh, important about having a homestead? You know, why is that the thing we got to do? Yeah, I, I, I believe that, uh, you know, for years I was in environmental studies and, and, you know, figuring out what the real and wrong problems are with this world and, and understanding that the more you know about your own world, how it works, all the interplay, your own home, your food, you know, and you have instant access, you know who the gardener is if you're the gardener is an important thing, right? Less chances of uh, getting poisoned by uh, outside forces. Right. So, yeah. I mean, we've been talking about doing stuff for a while now. I know we're going to do some, some history stuff across America. You've been pretty interested in Tartarian history since the beginning. Some people have seen you online as giant, you know, and you've posted a lot of things. What, yeah. what are some of the things that you believe about America that are different, you think, than what mainstream history right now is telling us is acceptable to believe? Yeah, well, I'm, uh, my, my, uh, you know, look at the history of America is tied into a lot of uh, esoteric and occult uh, characters and stuff like yourself. We, we look into a lot of similar things and see that there's a lot of history that's been hidden. And, uh, you know, who, who are these these hidden characters? What is it that they're hiding? And is it connected to the overall story of humanity, right? Is, is all of our histories intertied? Is this the final chapter of this long unveiling of uh, man's purpose and mission in the world, you know? So I look into a lot of those details of how to find these breadcrumbs that have been left behind by all of our culture and how it ties into America. It's interesting looking at uh, the history of Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, uh, studying the, the Native American and Egyptian and, and all the, the Buddhist ideas about the afterlife, the before life and uh, so many of these things are becoming more and more understandable as technology progresses. So it kind of says to me that technology was at a higher progressed time in the past when they were thinking these thoughts. Do you have any thoughts on on that? Like, what do you think about technology in the past? Yeah, I think that there's uh, we've probably gone through cycles where, you know, we got to a point and we had a very uh, similar technology to what's going on now. And we probably failed to uh, win that battle. It, it seems to come to a double-edged sword. So there's there's some sort of force that is, you know, maybe the opposite in this duality that um, will engage with it in a way to overpower and overcome humanity. And humanity has an opportunity to use it to interact and, and, and build a more... Uh, you know, balanced and, and fair society. And then if they don't figure it out quick enough, there's some sort of element that comes in um, to destroy it. I don't know if you ever heard of a guy named Jason Reza Giorgiani. And he, he wrote a, quite a few books, but one of his books is, um, and, he, and he has this, this idea that he unfolds in, in a lot of the books where it's about Prometheus and what he thinks Prometheus is, that it's an archetype and it's a... Um, it's an energy that's passing on. It's helping us pass on information. It's, it, it's living in the spirit world, uh, helping us engage in all different sorts of things, arts and, and construction and, and just communication with, 
with each other and that we're progressing towards something. But uh, he seems to think, and I, and I tend to, you know, believe his assessment is that we get to a certain point and if we don't figure it out and we, it doesn't seem like we're going to work it out, it has something built in that um, unfolds a destruction sequence. And he thinks we're getting close, close that time. That's wild because, you know, so I was just recently looking into like the Buddhist and Vedic ideas of hell because they have the Naraka and the Naraka is kind of more like a time period of hell, which looks like where limbo comes from is you're there for however long it takes you to burn off your karma before you can move on to, you know, the next realm or, or do the next thing. But it's created, it's a created hellscape, a kind of hell realm created by a, a, a yogi who's trying to help correct the the dharmas of these people so it's interesting because isn't that kind of what we're talking about when we say like Rocco's basilisk or some of yeah. the ai stuff that we're headed towards the metaverse that they can create i mean even people are talking about in prisons designing prison meta uh, hellscapes someone gets yeah. 20 lifetimes in prison in like 20 seconds with the dmt trip you know because they were punished so it's crazy because we're building literally heaven and hell using this technology but it matches more these ancient vedic uh and buddhist designs yeah, absolutely. I, I believe that uh, the technology and, and what we call AI is uh, it's, it's basically a spiritual interface. Like we're, we're able to engage the spirit world and see if it can be brought into a kind of a robotic interface or through our technology. Right. There's a lot of details. I, I've, been, I've been talking with a few people about the details of, of what's believed and how did we get the technology why does it look like history and certain people involved in history like you know shakespeare or, or who really shakespeare is behind the scenes you know it's a group of lawyers of the court that were involved with england and uh you know john d was invoking spirits and and the one main spirit that he invoked that gave him a lot of information on um, how how they should engage the public and create this shakespeare character was calling itself uh the spear shaker Right. And that's where the, the, the name, the moniker comes from, the title wow. of the, for his last name. And that's Athena. And he also, um, I, I believe he refers to her as also as he believes that it's Sophia, you know, and that there's this um, goddess character that has all these names, just like God has all these names. This goddess has all these different names and has mythological stories uh, attributed to her throughout history and sometimes she's the daughter sometimes she's the mother um, and there's usually a son involved and this is kind of like the jesus character and so um, i associate this character as being possibly mary kali you know all the different form you know saraswati all the different feminine goddesses in hinduism uh you know minerva um it's just different um you know, ways of referring to her slightly changed energy, but she's a warrior goddess, right? So she's in, kind, of, kind of masculine in a way, right? Yeah, I mean, you look at the the staff, Hermes staff, the me the medicine staff, the Trimagistus staff. Um, it's also used by Isis. Isis's staff in the Epic of Gilgamesh used to it's two snakes in the double helix around a needle, right? It's this kind of DNA mutation metamorphosis. Do you think that around the world that these changes, I mean, Native Americans have this kind of similar story. What are the differences and, you know, why, why you just said that they're uh, flavors of her energy, you know, what do you think that that means and why do they look at them slightly changed? It's the same thing as why the, the Hindu culture uh, has multiple gods is because it's really just one God. It's all just Vishnu, right? And behind that, you, there's even, you know, uh, there's a long history of, of Hindu culture that has many books and, and go into all kinds of details of questions that they pondered about how the unfolding of this original God comes. So one kind of view on it is that Vishnu is, is dreaming and he's projecting his energy inside of the matrix, which is Aditi. And Aditi is the uh, the goddess of the matrix of the darkness of the universe that has nothing in it. And Vishnu is projecting into that matrix and uses a character that he creates that comes out of the, the lotus that's growing out of his belly button in the dream state that Vishnu is in, and that's Brahma. And so Brahma starts 
to learn how to create and figures out that it needs a duality and stuff like that. But these, these feminine characters are very important because um, they're the creative aspects, really. You know, Brahma, Vishnu, uh, Aditi, you know, don't really have a sex, just like any god doesn't have a sex. So um, I think that there's a lot of uh, showing this, the sacred goddess and the sacred god and having multiple names to it and all that stuff. It's really just one thing. And then it has, uh, you know, feminine and masculine aspects. And so when we see it or interface with it or have mythologies written down about it, those are just uh, that version, that flavor, because it has to interact at different times differently depending on what it's interacting with and what time period and all this stuff. So it, I, I see it as actually one and the same thing and it just split up into multiple things showing itself differently at different times, different places. So the deluge, what about this uh, period of the Tower of Babel or this flood? Um, you know, what do you think about this splitting of a singularity or a singular culture that it might have existed? How, what do you think went down? Yeah, so it's most likely, I mean, my thoughts on that are, are that most likely, you know, it was, uh, you know, nature, the spiritual world, the physical world are, are all the same because when we get down to it, really everything is nothing, right? It's all, you know, it's all theoretical and spiritual behind it all, you know, and this it's creating this through, uh, you know, making spin in objects and then it's able to look like it's manifest and stuff like that, right? So um, I think we're dealing with a, a long test of um, figuring out how to master the dream, which is, you know, Vishnu's dream, which is now the, the physical place that we're interacting in. And when it gets to certain points, like, you know, we were mentioning, talking about before, is that it, it thinks that the technology has gotten so far that it's going to be used in the wrong way because it wants to make perfection, ultimately. It wants to perfect physicality, and it's getting to a place where it's actually going downhill, and the thing the negative side of the duality is, is starting to win. And so it has to reset the game and that, and it did it with water at, at that point, you know, and I think that's why we all, you know, all cultures, all, all nations, all places on earth dealt with it at the same time. It was a destruction period. Right. Uh, you look at the, the water, the um, Western interior sea, seaway and these different parts of the United States that have had floods and, um, we're told they happened so long ago, but science is starting to admit that they were more recent within the last few thousand years or 10,000 years, at least at the, at the most. So yeah, are we starting to see science admitting that uh, these things happen? Is that, is that what's going on? Like we're, we're, is all of it just coming to the fruition? Why are they letting us know that this is really the truth? Yeah. Um, so letting us know that, that, these stories of the Bible are, are basically true and stuff like that, that they didn't want to kind of admit before because they didn't really. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems like the Veda even, right? Like all of these old stories about these uh, flying saucers in the Veda are start. Are probably, I mean, oh, everything's up for grabs. What could be true now? It's no longer just myth, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I feel what we're dealing with is this, this thing that is the duality also has the capabilities of, of being physical because it's just a manifestation of the spiritual, right? So um, what we call the duality, some people call Satan or demons or the devil or evil spirits, uh, you know, monsters, all these things, they have a purpose. And um, one, of, one of the things they like to do, because they, they don't think like us where, you know, I, I would say the good, you know, things that, that seem to be good and more natural and stuff, they want to seek balance. They just want to be fair and they want to interact where, you know, hey, you know, as long as I can have mine and I can have experiences, with life, and I want you to too, because we can all, we can all share in the experiences of having a good life. These things don't think like that. Their, their uh, thoughts are, are about dominating things, about taking control over it. And, and putting pressure on it, right? So we have this pressure element always in the world, kind of like gravity or whatever you want to call it, um, where it, it causes things to go through processes because if not, things may just seek homeostasis, seek balance and stay there. And so you don't really have a lot of action. So this is like the wave creator, right? These things 
uh, their energy is all about domination and, and uh, explosions and, you know, they're initiators and pushers of things. And so they'll always dominate and get to the top of any kind of organization that there is, government, whatever it may be, religion. And so they ultimately don't want us to know how it is to combat their energy because that would go against their dominance, right? So it doesn't make sense for them to not, you know, stop in what they're doing. And so they would, they would dominate everything, all of our information, what we see as history and all that. It doesn't mean that they would be uh, completely able to, uh, you know, dominate every little piece of it and that we're just getting nothing but lies, but they'll definitely do whatever they can to make the information hard to find and dilute it with lies. Yeah. You think about the um, changing of the story of God in the Bible and in the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh and in all, almost every story, the Gnostics really point this out. It looks like even though God's omnipotent and omnipresent and beyond the Alpha and the Omega, it seems like God's growing as a person or changing. Is that a thing? What do you think about are we affect is the creation affecting the creator in any way? What do you think? Yeah, yeah, I believe that what we are is we are also a representative. Just like the, um, the there's multiple gods, we are in essence one of those multiple gods. All of us, we're we're pieces. Everything is a piece of it, and and what it's doing is is it's figuring out how to overcome challenges that it doesn't even know are there until it, it discovers them. Kind of like in video games when you have a map that's all blacked out and once you get closer to the edges, it opens up more of the map so you can see more and then new challenges come and there's bosses and all this stuff. So it, it, it I believe, wanted to have existence, to have interactions and, and part of either the ability to even have existence or it already set this in as a condition as it didn't want to know what it was going to uh, experience and interact with so that it can have those interactions as a new thing. And then it becomes a challenge, just like we like playing video games and we want to get to the next level to have that new challenge. Uh, It's probably something in that realm where it is trying to, uh, figure out the game that it already created for itself. And that's why we come into this world not knowing anything, right? It, God has sent itself in there and it erases all memory so that it can have a, a, a real interaction with, with the uh, other elements there. And therefore, it can also um, judge itself and figure out, okay, when I came in like this with this kind of energy and I interacted like this to this situation, it didn't have a good outcome. So, you know, I'm going to kind of erase that and then I'm going to retry with another version of it, maybe just slightly different, and, you know, see what happens when that happens, right? So it's just constant uh, interactions and uh, solution afterwards. It's interesting you keep bringing up video games. I've been studying a lot about artificial intelligence, learning systems, reoccurring neur- neur- um, recurrent neural nets. I wonder how close they are to do you, the simulation theory. Do you think that it's real? Like how close is that to what's going on? Yeah, uh, my take on the simulation theory is I think that, that people think of it in the, uh, in the opposite way. Like I think that what it is that we're in is why we built simulations. And now that we are building simulation, we refer to it like, oh, so this place that we're in seems like a simulation, right? So it does still, you know, basically say that, you know, we are in a simulation, but it's, we're figuring out that uh, we just model things after our world. You know, we can't help but model things after what it really is, right? So, it's kind of like thinking of it in the opposite way, right? You're, 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 uh, you're a part of this world. This world was always a simulation. Now we're modeling simulation about the world. So that's why we're finding it to be so close, you know, to what we consider a simulation. But yeah, I think that that's what, what God is doing is it's kind of like a simulation and it's interacting in the simulation through us. And then we're coming out with, you know, solutions or failures or whatever. And then it, you know, redoes it and, and 
maybe every one of these collapses are a redo of the larger period of time that the simulation runs through, right? But each one of these individual uh, things that happen and us as characters coming down and interacting with it, doing little mistakes also goes feeds into it and it learns from itself, right? But there are some evil people, like you mentioned, there are people that are trying to control the system. Do you think that the people that are trying to control the system, uh, what's the end goal for them? Is it not to elevate human consciousness? I mean, isn't that kind of a, a natural consequence of um, be- bettering your, 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 your world? Or, or where are they headed? Is it more of a Death Eater thing? What do you think? Yeah, I think that they, they uh, the ones that we consider able to get in control of uh, corporations and, and governments, and every, everything we can think about that has a lot of power, uh, their intent is they're the test. They're, they're the ones causing the pressure and the test, and they will use it to uh, extreme means, almost like they don't, they won't have an end to what they're willing to do. The only time that they get stopped from doing it is from our reactions to make sure that life carries on, right? They're kind of like, they're willing to, to, to destroy life. I think about it this way. To first create uh, uh, existence is you, you have to split. God has to split itself into two sides, pretty much, right? And even the opposite sort of flavors and energies to those two sides because they have to be clashing uh, oppositions in all ways, right? So uh, a form of God that was in a a higher, you know, um, kind of omnipotent state or something like that was, I I think, to what we refer to as, as Satan, right? And controls demonic uh entities that were maybe originally what you call angels or whatever they were high powered next level down from god sort of entities they were the strongest ones and this is why they say oh it was the strongest angel of god and everything that went down and fell right so they had to fall to to play the opposite end to play the chess game on the opposite side of the board right so they were the ones that were fallen. And then the condition of that was, is that because you have such an extreme behavior and anger and power and all this stuff, and it's basically probably exact opposite of what we consider heaven. We consider heaven is the ideal, the perfect uh, idea of the dream. And then this is the opposition to the dream is, is what fell, right? So it's still God. And this is kind of going into thinking of God as the Abraxas, right? This, it's dual thing. Everything is God. So all the things that fell and all that stuff um, and are, you know, what we are as individuals put into this um, interaction, we see them as an opposing thing and that they're evil and all that. And they are, uh, but they have a purpose and their, and their job is, to cause confusion and test things and make sure things get pushed along. Um, ultimately, the only way that you can make a perfection within existence is you have to you have to have things to interface with and to mess with and that are going to have um, entanglement and rejection and all these different reactions. And you can only do that over time to, to eventually get to a solution on what you do and you don't do right and so i think technology has to be progressed humans have to be progressed and they wouldn't do the progression on their own because they would just find you know gardens or situations that provide the food and the shelter and all the things for them and they would just learn how to be harmonized with that situation and they're fine with that they don't want why would you want to grow outside of that why not just you know, perfect your relationship with that area and just move with it and have peace and enjoy your family and all that stuff, right? So that the these negative entities or negative energies that are manifest to uh, incite things, to cause confusion, and to be uh, causing trickery and, and um, engaging with us where they, 
they capture us in, with magic and manipulation and psychology and all this different stuff, create empire model and pull us together and force us to uh, take in their, um, you know, spiritual system, like turn them into religion. They, they kind of take what we naturally have as spiritual systems, turn them into religion, and then force us to uh, engage in it in a certain way. And then they, you know, create wars with other groups, and then they have us go to war with them and everything. They're constantly pushing us towards um, having lots of interactions that need solutions, that need tools to be built to fix them, and it's progressing us constantly. And the end result is that it, over time, we will keep on progressing and building on those progressions until we build machines. And, and machines and technology are the ultimate uh, magic, right? And if you, you know, read the, the you know, Christian way of, of looking at it, these, these creatures, and it's in the Hindus, uh, you know, it's in, in Vedic information and stuff like that, too. Um, right they've got the, these the, the flying saucers right and these the bells the you know the the electric bells the high the flying bells they have all this technology it's a big the center of egyptian stuff is technology as well it seems like every major religion focuses on this yeah. technology yes and and the, and the ability of certain individuals being kind of master magician wizard that are interfacing with it and using it and some for good and some for bad. There's good wizards, bad wizards, and all that stuff, right? So I think the bad wizards, what they want, they want the ultimate wand, you know, using crystals, and they always use crystals and stuff like that for their, uh, you know, all their magical rituals and, and, you know, on their staffs and stuff like that. Because they know if you tune them, everything holds a frequency, and if you tune it and you amp up that frequency, you can make it manipulate things. We obviously know now that we can take uh, vibrations and, and, you know, microwave things, and, you know, uh, ruin things. You can make people's skin burn. You can make them want to vomit and shit. We can, we can manipulate pretty much anything in the physical world uh, by these amplified tones or waves, right? And so I think that that's what they're what they're in it for and why they're doing it is because they want to get, uh, you know, the manipulation of crystals and, and magic and wizardry to a point that they can open up the abyss. And that's where they are. That's where they're from is they were put down into the abyss. They had to be locked down there. So the story is with the Christians is that, you know, Gabriel throws them down into the pit, into the abyss and Uriel keeps them down there with a breastplate that was all had crystals and everything and had magic incantations and no one would really know exactly what it meant, but these are angels and it can keep them down there, but then they always have to be watched over. This gate had to be watched over. So in the Emerald tablets of Thoth, these stories, it's like in the fifth tablet where it's either the fifth or the sixth tablet where he talks about why uh, Atlantis was destroyed. And it was because these demons had slipped out of uh, the watchful eye of a character that, you know, some would associate with Satan or could be this Uriel character that was making sure that they didn't get out from underneath to come and corrupt the, the top because perhaps uh, Enki, like the, the serpent yeah. and Sumerian myths. Exactly. Yeah. So there's, there's a, there's a character that we're confusing now as being um, like the king of the evil and it looks more like from my studies that it's not it's not a, a king of evil. It's something that's watching over the evil and it has more power than them, but they can slip past because they're not uh, they're not physical. And so they can get through the cracks. They can work their way through uh, dragon ley lines or whatever and get up. And then they they assume bodies, especially if they can somehow convince uh, some of these wizards that they're going to get more powers from invoking them and helping them release them through magical spells and stuff that, uh, you know, have been found and hidden and destroyed and lost throughout history. Um, once they get in, they start building onto this technology, progressing to the point like, you know, we had in Atlantis. And then this thing like wakes up as far as the Emerald Tablet talked about, it wakes up, it finds out that they got loose and that they're actually creating havoc on the surface. 
So it causes a great, great destruction. It's some sort of power underneath, underneath the earth crust or in the abyss or whatever. It causes a great uh, destruction on the physical realm and pulls these things as many as it can back under, but doesn't get them all. It, it never, they never seem to get them all in all these stories. And so that's how I believe that they're, enough of them are hiding in the shadows and stuff like that, waiting for their opportune time to invoke man that wants power and tempts them with it and then gets them to rub the lamp, release the gin, the genie, and get their three wishes, right? And they become master wizards. And then those things, I believe, for you doing that, they get to enter into you. And so we might be seeing a human, but it's actually something that has invoked a demon. Wow. Takes over the body. That's like an Aladdin. Sorry, I could it's the Tad Stones thing. The first thing I think of is uh, Aladdin and the genie power and Jafar, and you, be, you get the genie gin inside of you and you become a genie yourself because the demon's uh, taking you over. It's interesting about the chest plate, too, because Star yeah. Wars, you know, Darth Vader's chest plate is Aaronic priesthood chest plate. It's got all the stones from Aaron. Aaron's supposed to wear these stones to protect him against demons that they couldn't quite get. And whoever knew that the Ark of the Covenant was about Ghostbusters, or rather the other way around. But I mean, yeah. if we'll do a deep dive on Ghostbusters, that's crazy. Um, yes, it's all interconnected <laughs> for sure. They know this. These these elites know this, and people that are uh, well read into the occult and the esoteric information that's out there, they they know this, and this is why they're putting it into stuff. They're, some of them might be doing it so that. They can release the information, but release it under the entertainment title. And so they, you know, may not get killed for releasing the information because they're doing it just, you know, cartoonishly or whatever it may be. And they know that not many people will take it seriously. I mean, there's no way to know who's on what side and why it is that they're uh, releasing the information. It could just be that humans have a natural uh, story inside of us that know, know this stuff. And so... Um, when they're when they're telling these stories and they know that we'll like to engage with it because we'll feel it you know what i mean like it feels like we feel akin to hey you know that's an interesting story why do i feel like like that could be real but yeah it's really not but so well, I, I mean that's sure. that star wars is shot in like tunisia right they did the you know so on location you've got this idea of moses being akhenaten that we've been covering recently in the egyptian stuff yeah. um the fact that they shot all that stuff in africa and around location where uh moses and abraham would have been in, in parts of the bedouin parts of tunisia yep. is pretty pretty compelling I, I wonder what you think about the the world of these you kind of manichaean what you're saying this idea of this dualism thing which has been in all these gnostic texts and uh, egyptian mythology you have this kind of dualism of horus and set which has been the subject of um you know the obi-wan show is really about horus and set you've got his one eye in the cover and Seth has been cut, his body has been cut into pieces. Obi-Wan watches Darth Vader's body cut into pieces like Seth. And Darth Vader is, you know, literally put back together like Seth. Um, I, I wonder in, the, in, in terms of recycling these stories, do you think that is, is media the new religion or why are we seeing this in, in why is it okay to pretend that it's a mythology now in, in theater instead of it being like, you have to believe in Darth Vader? Yeah, I, I think um, a lot of this is, Hopefully, this is kind of answering uh, your question. Well, at least this is what it made me think, is that uh, a lot of this is embedded in us, and we don't really know where our thoughts come from. And, and a lot of people have, have talked about, uh, you know, their daemon, right? There's like some spirit that gives them the information. And, th and this is something that, you know, I brought up to you that if we can figure out a way to, you know, they have these reaction videos to, to music and, and uh, you know, they never heard before rock and roll. And somehow they're able to listen to it and kind of watch the videos and react to it. Um, I have been studying, uh, you know, what maybe uh, a, a specific daemon or the, the stronger daemons, how they've been interacting with musicians and artists and, uh, you know, the movie producers, movie writers, and all that stuff for a lot of years. So I think you know, some of this is is this thing, this spirit force, this daemon that's uh, sending us information on uh, 
how to look into and find out these stories and stuff like that. And also embed them into the art, you know, and it's giving them these songs. And I have many, many of the most famous songs you can ever think of. And, and this is what I kind of ask people to think about is most of the most important songs, the most famous songs that have ever, we've ever had in, in at least modern history with rock and roll and all that stuff. Most people don't know what it is that they're talking about. You know what I mean? They don't know the whole story. They hear a few lines and stuff. They like the music. They like the overall production. They like some of the lyrics, but they, they're not paying attention closely to the whole story that's actually being told. And it's put very poetically and stuff like that and kind of symbolic on purpose, like, like uh, 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 Stairway to Heaven, right? It, there's, there's a lot of symbology. He, he speaks about the woman that we all know. You know, that's very key. There's, there's a lot of key uh, phrases and symbolic things that he, that he states in there. The stairway to heaven's Jacob's ladder, buying it. And yeah, the Sophia of Christ being the woman we all know or the, the goddess yeah. of many names. Yeah, absolutely. And that song was supposed to be written in like two minutes, right? They just like wrote it. They just had, they just kind of whittled it and it happened. And yeah. same as the Mario brothers, definitely created by somebody else. I wonder about, uh, you know, do you know that myth about Lucifer being the, the writer of all the show tunes? Cause Lucifer made all the worship music in the archetypical story. You have to imagine every day Lucifer is like, Oh man, I'm sorry about yesterday. The, the water show wasn't that great, but tomorrow today we're going to have the lions, but tomorrow we're gonna have the lions in fire. And then the next day, it's like, I don't know what I was thinking. It wasn't great with the lions, but the fire will be cool. And then the fire happens like, no, 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 no. We need motorcycles and we need, you know, everything at once fireworks. And then every day, just trying to worship God harder and harder and thinking that today is the day that I really get it. And then thinking yet tomorrow, no, yesterday wasn't worshiping hard enough until Lucifer goes crazy. And that's yeah. all we're, all music that we listen to. The best of pop music is Lucifer just writing um, you know, love songs to God that have been rewritten to be about people. And then eventually the more recent stuff is Lucifer saying, I'm going my own way. I don't need you, God. Like every single song is like become yeah. that. <laughs> Absolutely. And there's always this, there's always a musical element character that's involved with retrieving this lost uh, part of God. And usually it's like a female character, right? Uh, with uh, Orpheus and all this stuff, right? And, and Demeter and, and his daughter uh, Eurydice, right? Um, and, and using music to play to the devil to uh, convince the devil to release this woman, right? And then she gets to come up for a certain amount of time and go back down, right? There's, there's you know, uh, there's always constantly, you know, the, the ones that play the harp or, you know, some sort of, you know, thing that led to the guitar. And this is where it eventually becomes, you know, the muse and, and the minstrel and all this stuff where music plays an important um, part in uh, invoking, um, you know, maybe, you know, demonic characters and stuff and, and showing them that we're kind of, we're, we're still trying to perfect arts and beauty and stuff like that. We're still engaged with making this place beautiful and, and tuning into the beauty. So don't give up on the process yet. Don't come and destroy us. You know what I mean? There's, until, there's some until Walmart had the Christian aisle from the fundamentalists in the late nineties, I feel like Mormons had like the best Christian music. And I wonder about that because their connection to the Gnostics, to uh, the book of Abraham and the Egyptians. And, and similarly with the Jehovah's witness, because their whole thing is about the pyramid um, what do you think that's about, like the, the, the Egyptian connection to this? Uh, yeah, that's uh, it's. Um, yeah, I, I think that, you know, Egypt was a very important uh, empire and it was, uh, you know, played a big role in humanity for a long time. I would say, you know, that and um you know, ancient Tamil or Southern India are some of the oldest uh, places. And also, you know, we're finding them all over in the Middle East and, and South America and stuff like that. Um, but th those uh, older elements could be, you know, those buildings could be a part of you know, Atlantis or previous. 
larger empires and stuff like that that were destroyed. Uh, but it seems like if you're following the book of thought that it was Egypt played a role after uh, Atlantis was destroyed, or maybe it was just a sector that didn't get so destroyed and they ran there and, you know, kind of built it up more and used that as a, the new empire, you know, but it might have been a piece of the older empire. Um, what did Charles I, Taze Russell see in it? That so, I mean, like Charles T Charles Taze Russell, you know, was obsessed with the architecture revealing uh, the secrets of nineteen and uh, the you know the the uh, end of the world. You know, is there? Do you think there's any truth to any of the the Russell stuff, or what do you what do you think? Yeah, I I, I think that um, <clears throat> I think we're dealing with uh, you know individuals that were occult and esoterically. Uh, taught, studied, and, um, you know, brought this information uh, into new ways of uh, interfacing with the people at the time, and they were obviously um, Christian. And so they had to embed it, this esoteric and occult information, into the Christian, because through books, through stone, this is how we pass down the breadcrumbs and the mission onto the next generation. Cause I think they all know that it's not going to, you're not going to make the actual uh, utopia or paradise that they're looking for until uh, a further generation down the line. And they have to keep the, they have to keep the carrot in front of uh, humanity by saying it's going to happen their time and day so that they won't give up on it because it seems, uh, it's very daunting for people to not give in to evil if they think that there isn't going to be a solution within their lifetime. And so they're playing on uh, psychological and emotional stuff. But I think these guys knew exactly when this was going to happen. And they were on a mission that they weren't going to see the solution to in their lifetime. So they had to embed it into books and information that would be passed down to the generation that I believe we're in now. And they knew it was going to be now. And, uh, and they knew where it was going to be at. So the headquarters for the Rosicrucians is in San Jose. That's the headquarters of the world is in San Jose, right? And they built a little mini uh, Egyptian, uh, you know, temple museum there. They have all these different buildings that they're copying Egyptian. They have like um, mummies and uh, actual, you know, like real mummies and they die cast actual temples. It's, you know, it's pretty impressive for a little temple. Yeah, I admit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, they, and then they, they stuck it at a very specific place. If you look at, if you look at it from Google Maps, it actually it, the the streets come up to a pyramid, and then the right at Hoover Junior up. High School, right across the street. Yeah, <laughs> and if you if you look the streets that go down it, it's Winchester and Bascom. It looks like an obelisk, and almost at the bottom, it looks like almost like a pair of, of balls, so like a penis and balls at the bottom, right? We got to do an interview with some of the kids who went to the Hoover Junior High there, because I mean, I already got. I mean, I. You lived in San Jose, right? Like you were pretty close yeah, to there. I, I, grew, I grew up with uh, friends that weren't there. I lived right around the corner from. When was the youngest you went? I went in like first grade and third grade. I think every other year they would take us to the temple, which is like a half hour drive in Santa Cruz. Do you remember when? When did you? When do you remember going to the temple? Like, I I, I uh, grew up uh, one block away on Park and Heading. And, wow. Uh, so I, I was, uh, my grandparents owned a house on Heading right there at the uh, Rose Garden area. And I, I used to go to Halloween trick-or-treating for all those real huge mansions through there and everything. Right? It's like one of the old elite areas of San Jose right there in that area. But uh, yeah, I was, uh, yeah, I was from probably like five years old or something. I don't remember going there at that young, but I remember, yeah, school, uh, I, I didn't go to school there. I went. My my father lived in Campbell, which was uh, you know like fifteen miles away or something. Like totally, that. So I, I think Sanskrit in Campbell, <laughs> the Adobe yeah. Temple they built there. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Inter interesting places for sure. Um, so yeah, I, I remember going there when I was on a uh, field trip, but also I just used to go there. We used to walk there all the time and hang out. My my grandparents thought it was really interesting place, so we used to just walk around the ground. And then when I grew up and you know hanging out with my friends as a teen and all that stuff and smoke weed and all that stuff but a lot of times we just drive over there and just go and you know smoke blunts by the little uh pyramid that was uh, a dedication to the original founder of the place and all that. <laughs> i, used to I go mean there all the time 
Do you remember the 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 astro the what's it called this the constellation the const what's it called where you have stars they have a star show there um yeah 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 yeah, uh, yeah. what's it called I forget uh, yeah, observe it. not observatory. Ob- but a- no, because it's just fake stars in a big uh, yeah. theater room, and you can sit down planetarium, and it's, it's planetarium. a planetarium. And I used idea. to, I went to the planetarium the last week. I think they took us at school on the last week in like 1996 or seven. That the planetarium was open. I forget exactly when it was, but then yeah. for years, for over a decade, the planetarium was closed, and they couldn't fix it, even though. I would constantly, because I was so naive, I'd be like, I know people, I could find somebody, we'll, we'll fix the planetarium. But I think it was broken on purpose. And now they have a new, they're like, oh, the new planetarium's coming. The new pl-. finally came in like 2012, and there's a new planetarium. So I really want, I haven't seen it actually since the, the new planetarium was built, put in. So yeah, we, sh- I, we should go, but you should go yeah. if you need to get the chance. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, we'll, we'll plan that for sure. It's, it's an important place, and, and there's a lot of important history that, uh, you know, people don't even, people don't even know it's there, but there's a lot of uh, important characters that were involved with that place. Um, like a an artist, his name is uh, uh, Nicholas Rorick. You heard, heard of Nicholas Rorick? No. So, so he was a he was a famous uh, cultist. Uh, he was the one that came up. Well, it's argued, but he was supposedly the one that came up with putting the pyramid on the back of the dollar bill. Like he he was the artist behind that. And he was, uh, um, you know, a regular and really close knit with the founders of the Rosicrucian Society, and specifically that one in San Jose. And um, so there's this, um, there's a story of the Levandry uh, French um, fur trappers that were actually in your area. I think where they're from, Canada and. And Minnesota and stuff like that. And they, and they would come all the way down to like Colorado uh, fur trapping. And him and his sons, you know, don't quote me on the exact story, but I, I believe it was like him and his sons came across these pillars on the Rocky. And they, one uh, kind of had an opening, I, I think. And then they, they went up and they climbed up it and they opened it up and they found this box. And in the box, it had a bunch of M's around it. And in the box was a stone. And it was, they said that this was Jacob's pillow stone. That's what they thought it was, that this is Jacob's pillow stone. So they they brought it, um, uh, somehow it got to the Rosicrucian. Somehow it was sent to them. And uh, they were saying that people were after them or something like that. They needed to send it somewhere that was a museum that would keep it protected and all this stuff. So it was sent to the Rosicrucian order in San Jose and uh, because Nicholas Rourke was a, a cultist and knew all this esoteric information and you know Egyptian and all this all this stuff about history of all the different cultures and everything he seemed to know what it was they gave it to him you know somehow you know we don't know the conversation that happened exactly all the details but it was given to him and then he took it and he brought it, and this is where Ghostbusters ties in, which is interesting. He brought it to New York, and they, uh, at the time, he was working with masons uh, that were building the Master Building Institute for Artists in New York, right around the um, uh, Central Park, right? And so uh, they were laying the the cornerstone and when they laid the cornerstone einstein like all these major players of the time were there for it and einstein specifically was quoted saying that this is the most important thing he had ever done in his life nothing else was more important than this moment of laying this cornerstone and it was believed that 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 uh nicholas rorick uh embedded this into that cornerstone so Years pass, and um, the son of the the mason that um, uh, you know built the building, funded it, and all this stuff, or collected all the funds, and was the main operator or whatever. He handed over to Nicholas Rourke for a little while, and there was like a falling out. But supposedly this was embedded there, and uh, uh, they found out from so, somehow they found out that a Jesuit had come there. And he was working the front desk, the son of the original mason at the building. And um, 
they end up finding the guy down in the basement near that cornerstone killed. I think his, his like legs and arms were tied and he was murdered. And I don't know if they go into if the, if the cornerstone was broken open, but I, as far as I remember, I think it might have been broken open. And so that thing was stolen. Um, there's all these different things about the direction of that cornerstone and everything was very interesting. I think it pointed towards uh, 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 St. John's Chapel. And that, I believe, was like the oldest church, the one that uh, George Washington prayed for the United States or something like that. A lot of real, they always are into geomancy and coordinates and pointing things towards other things and leaving these bread trails of why they're uh, hiding certain things and where they may be hiding them when they get moved because someone figures it out, blah, blah, blah. But that building um, was figured out that that building and the, and the building that they used for the address of the Ghostbusters building were actually merged and overlapped. And that was the building that they used that all the ghosts and everything. Wow. Ghostbusters. Interesting. Which is an interesting correlation where someone knew to tie that in so that if you looked into it, you can figure out that there's a there's a connection to um, you know the spirit world and demons and stuff like that. And Jacob's ladder can be invoked through the stone, and then you can get the ladder goes from heaven down into hell. And so that you have to traverse Jacob's ladder to get out of this the abyss right and so that these demons it's somehow connect you see what i'm saying where there's some sort of connection with these demons wanting that stone so that they can get released out of the abyss a tether as above so below angels ascending and descending upon the yeah. golden ladder hmm interesting yeah, yeah well, so that's one of those things where we'll, 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 we'll try to go and investigate that too you know, I was going to say, because, you know, there's so many things they're just starting to rebuild Egypt. And I guess that's been a thing. But America, America is this place with the Masons, the Freemasons, of course, but the Jesuits with their churches, monasteries and missions across America, the Deseret Mormons with their you know, the Latter Day Saint uh, Deseret Empire. that They're putting these rebuilding cathedrals on places that they say that there were cathedrals originally. I mean. What is that? So it seems like America is the place to look. Where, where are some of the other places? Like, where are a couple of places you can think of that are uh, that blow your mind in, in America that we need to check out and investigate more? Um, well, I think our our uh, you know our hometown is very important, <laughs> right? It's, it's, Santa Cruz is crazy because it's on the sacred crossing, right? And then Branch of Forty. Who was he? Let's look into it. What really happened? Yeah, so there's there's interesting geomancy. So if you follow, you know, and it might not be like I guess technically the right term, but some people use this term as, as you know Jefferson and and these founding fathers and the Masons and all that. They use uh, geomantic um, uh, theory or whatever. They know that geology holds frequencies because there's certain things that are lying underneath. Uh, all geology, right? And it and it holds these frequencies, and and then you know there's alignment with where the placement of these stars are and how the planets move and all that. Where they 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 figured out that there's there's some sort of um, map or direction that God is kind of sending us, right? And they're trying to follow these. Um, you know, these movements and these cycles and these alignments with planets and also how our geology played out to start, um, you know, building places and then showing, okay, well, we built this and in here we're going to embed some secret symbology and stuff so that you can follow this to the next step. And once you start looking at what they've been doing and how they've been traveling and their writings and everything else, you start seeing that they were, they knew to come to America, um, you know, and I have a theory on, you know, what that might mean, what is America and all this stuff, but not only, uh, you know, European, uh, Western uh, cultures have, have done this and, and were aiming to come to America and specifically uh, to the West Coast. They wanted to go all the way to the West Coast, but it looks like if you follow these Native American groups and stuff like that, that they were embedded with the information to come to the Americas and specifically we're looking for uh, places here too. And one of the main places is the West Coast, 
specifically California and uh, Silicon Valley, right? And, you know, there's these old stories of the Spanish, and I know you know this of Bolivia, right? Where Montavo wrote the story of this uh, warrior queen, right? She fits all the uh, signs and symbols of this sacred goddess that's also a warrior, right? So if I, if la I, the lady, the girl that everybody knows, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and have I, uh, I think I've shared with you about what the word virago, right? Did I? I don't know. Go for it. Um, and you can you can probably look it up if you want to, sh to, to show everybody. But uh, this is where the word virgin comes from. We think that virgin means that uh, you have not had sex, right? But if you look at the etymology of, of virago, it, it doesn't. It's not about a woman that uh, doesn't have sex. It's about a, a woman that acts like a man. It's a warrior woman, a heroine, right? She's an Amazon. It, the Vero is uh, um, like uh, virility. That's the masculine part. So it's like a, a half man, half woman. And this is, this is why it fits into the story of Mary, right? Mother Mary, which gives birth to a male without a, without a male, uh, you know, seed. So um, she's, she's uh, an Amazon that, that is like a hermaphrodite that can give birth within herself, right? And this is story of Calibia. I think you're muted still. Sorry, I was just reading this. I was just, com uh, so Adam, so apparently 14 centuries later, earlier it's from the heroine of you know the amazon idea but vero man woman like you said which is a hermaphrodite kind of or whatever hermes trying to guess this idea but the name shows up in genesis adam gives eve the name virago so yeah. not not the name eve but yeah. virago which is you know this powerful man woman thing that could reproduce that's crazy i can't believe that that's and this, yeah. this is where virginity comes from for virgin virago yeah mm. and this is why virgo is after you know the astrological sign the zodiac sign virgo is so close to virago right so this is actually where this word comes from and now you know after time and, and different languages translating things it ends up becoming thought of a, in a certain way but technically it is very similar to thinking of it as a virgin but it's not just not having sex. It's about it ha being able to have sex with itself and then make a child. So the stories of Califia, um, they are Amazon women that give birth without a male. They didn't need a male. But every once in a while, they'd have a mutation, which was a male. And they would feed it to the griffin. They flew on the top of these griffins or dragons. And they would feed the, the male when they birthed the male instead of this female, like, like uh, Wonder Woman, right? Like Superwoman, Wonder Woman character right and um so they they worship the female or something more like them which is a virgo a virago a virgin yeah, or whatever right and then um they would feed this male but i believe in the story she decided to keep this one male because it seemed uh like it was a good male like you have to be that that uh perfect male or maybe the time came that they needed to start um uh, adapting to other areas because they were just living in this like perfect mythological area it was an island had all this gold and you know, things were great and all that stuff. So, I mean, it, everybody can interpret that however they want, but the story, the overall story is there where it's talking about this uh, Virago character and Mary fits into it. And Mary, right? If you split M-A-R from the Y, the Y is the male and Mar is Aries or a warrior, right? And so that's why, you know, Jesus looks, you know, is depicted symbolically, at least, you know, now we, we consider the symbolic depiction of him with long hair and everything like that. Michelangelo's also, breasts, you know, Michelangelo's version of Christ is very uh, af uh, hermaphroditic, you know, androgynous. Yes, because, that, because what it is, is it has to be, androgynous also but it's just a little bit more masculine but it has feminine qualities so jesus loves us all right he's very motherly he's very he cares about his children you see what i'm saying that's a motherly aspect so he's a male 
that also cares. So it's not just uh, an extreme form of like an Aries or a warrior that doesn't have the feminine aspect. And so the mother or Mary, and you'll see that kind of uh, those features among all the goddesses and, you know, the gods as well, right? Shiva is the consort of Kali, but she has, uh, I believe, three different names. I, I can't rattle off all the names, but in her different uh, forms, when she's sweet and, and nice and the motherly part, she has a certain name. I want to say Saraswati, but I, I think that's uh, the wrong point. But um, anyways, you know, the names aren't so important, but there's there's three versions of Shiva's wife, and one of them is Kali. And so she is, uh, Kali, Shiva's job is to destroy the demons or things that get out of whack to make sure that they end so that they can't just keep carrying on destruct, destroying stuff. But sometimes these demons in these stories get out of control so the demon that Kali had to interface with was one that um if you cut it its blood turned into another demon so it was like real it was it was impossible for any of the other gods to destroy this demon because every time they tried to it would just turn into more and more and more demons kind of like gremlins or something you know it's more of them popped out and so sh what she did is she had to go around cutting off all their heads and then she kept she had multiple arms and she kept this bowl and she would catch their blood before it would go to the ground and to make sure to get rid of it so it didn't go to the ground and become another demon. She had to drink it. And then she would keep their heads on a necklace and stuff like that. Those were all demons. Those weren't humans. So we give Kali this, uh, the way that we think of it in Western society is, oh, it's this demoness. But she was actually in the story, she was killing demons. And she had to drink the blood because the blood would turn into another demon. See, she shot the sheriff, but she didn't shoot the deputy. And... Yeah. Exactly. Basically, yeah, tell it to the judge. I feel like most people are going to look at Kali and they're going to see the skulls around her necklace. It's going to be a real hard sell, but it's true. That's the that's the actual version of the story. It's interesting looking at America because you have Varigo because you have Virginia and you've got Maryland, you know, Marta, you know, Martha, you know, with this idea of the, the why. Um, there's a lot of places named after this idea in America. Do you, What do you think the deal is with, uh, you said earlier you had a theory on America, you know, why America was important and why it was chosen. What, what do you, what's your theory on that? The, the theory is, is that, um, you know, the end of the story has to, has to end at the end of the book and the end of the book, you know, the last book has to end at the end of the road. You know, it's, 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 it all has to match up the end, right? So the, the final place, the farthest west we can go is California, right? Or at least, you know, I feel like they consider that the last place and it's the last place in, in you know, continental U S right. As far as, uh, to the West that you can go, I guess you can consider Alaska, um, maybe further West, but, um, uh, depending on what kind of map you're looking at or things flatter or whatever, this and that. but, um, they believe it is. And then they, they, uh, named the golden gate, the golden gate, uh, for a reason. And the golden gate is, is, a mythological or uh it's a story within uh the egyptian belief system it's also embedded in astrology and stuff like that and that's the gate of um uh, i believe it's the gate of the gods or i might be mixing that up so there's the silver gate and there's the golden gate i believe the, the golden gate is the gate to uh enter and exit out of here but i think you have to be a god or something to do it right and so it was it was finished on January 5th, 1933. And before they allowed the public to walk across the bridge, you know, be a part of the grand opening for it, they had uh, Masons, Shriners, Rosicrucians, and other secret society groups uh, have their time for that. They did a certain ritual where they basically played out the temptations of Christ as he walked across the bridge and was confronted by all the temptations. And they finally passes uh the final temptation which is i believe it was a bunch of virgins or something like that a bunch of women offered and everything and then they had a little speech and said well this is the final uh place this is where the the, the final messianic character or this promised character the master builder as they call it is going to show up is going to be here through the through the golden gate the gate of the god right 
And so uh, that'd be great because it would mean that Jesus is coming through Oakland into San Francisco. And it's exactly how I always uh, I picture the second coming by accident as a kid. You can't help it. Right. Yeah. 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 It's very interesting. And, and then there's a lot of this is where the, the geomancy, the, the geography comes into play is um, the layout of the Bay Area is it's actually uh, so the word grail. Right. Uh, is is a great where you get the word gradient or things coming down into a cup or a bowl right any kind of any bowl or cup or whatever is grail because it's gradiated it's it's going down into a gradient it goes to the lower land and where you know the lower lands are all the valleys and everything are actually fertile points right and so you, you'll start getting into the words that are associated with this goddess like that it's she is always associated with the marshlands and fertile zones and stuff like that. So um, the bay itself has marshlands all around it. And it's this, it's like this little cup that's sitting there, right? And um, actually, Santa Clara County, uh, you know, Silicon Valley, was the fruit capital of the world at one point. It had the most fertile land because of the way it sits between these, these mountains that are surrounding it. And it goes down into this valley and then there's tons of fish and sea, uh, you know, food for these birds that eat it and poop it out and all that stuff. It's like the perfect uh, agricultural setup pretty much. Right. And in Egypt and the way that it was set up and everything is the same. And it actually looks like visually, if you look at it from the top, it looks it always looks like a stem and then a road that comes out or the stem of a cup, a chalice. Right. So if you look at Egypt, um, I don't know if you want to, can you pull up a map of, uh, of Egypt and, and, uh, and the layout? How they have yeah, it? one second. Egypt map. Or you could go to like maybe Google Maps or whatever. We could just uh, you can see how the Nile is. See how it looks like a, a stem and then there's a flower, like a lotus or something. It's always like a, um, you know, this long stem of a plant and then it fans out like a lotus near the ocean you see how it's like a it looks like a a flower like a flower offered and there's like even a little if you look uh right below the flower area you can see like a like a little leaf looks like a leaf coming off it even right Mm -hmm. interesting yeah. So it even it even shows up in 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 our geology that um, these symbols that they they uh, they hold as sacred, right? And so if you go to the Bay Area, um, you'll see that it it, it has a, a you know a flower and, and a, you know Grail kind of uh, look to it, right? Whereabouts do you mean? So if you go into the mouth. Are, I call it the mouth of the snake. Can you? Uh, maybe I should point that out. Do you see? Um, do you see how uh, if you're in uh, like Oakland and stuff like that, that's the top mouth of a snake, mm-hmm. snake creature. And then you know Santa Cruz and, and San Francisco and everything is the bottom jaw. It's almost mm-hmm. and there's there's an indentation right above the you know in Livermore area. You know like the Livermore area is right above like Hayward, right yeah. above. Hayward. There's a big indentation. It looks like where there was an eyeball of a snake. Hmm. Wow. You see that right? Yeah, right, right there, 580 or whatever. See yeah. that huge right there is like like an empty eyeball of like a dead snake, kind of, right? So you can see the mouth and it extends down. Yeah, that's crazy. And then, and then above it, you, you see like in Humboldt or you know, the top of the Bay Area. Um, Santa Rosa area and everything. It's actually, it looks like a big eagle. I actually have a video on this where I overlay it with um, snake eyeball and face and everything. And then the other top, see the, um, mm-hmm. see the water area. Uh, what is it called? Lake. Uh, yeah, right there. Yeah. yeah. That's like the eyeball of the eagle. And then the nose is the other waterway that's over here down, down a little further. Mm-hmm. And then it has like a beak structure. If you look, if you follow kind of those roads that go yeah. in Santa Rosa, like in the mouth of that eagle, you know, like like it could have been like an 
an old. It's uh, interesting because this is where a lot of fossils are. There's the fossil forest there, the crazy fossils that people say weren't trees, but are just uh, silicon uh, branches or Kindle yeah. from giant trees, you know. And the owl. From the right? nest, in the mouth oh. of the nest of this giant eagle, you know. Yeah. And, and the Bohemian Grove is right there in the head of that, that bird like looking dragon thing. Yeah, hold on, I have to go back for that. It's like uh, up here or something, right? Yeah, so, yeah, it's right around that. I think it's jaw or something. You just type it in. Bohemian Grove. Boom. And we'll pull out. Yep, down there. Yeah, see, right? Yeah, right in its, in its jaw, pretty much. Or it's lower jaw. Where you'd put a bird <laughs> if you were yeah. an eagle. Yeah, yeah. and so this, this kind of ties into, uh, you know, Hermes and the two snakes. So there's the symbology, it, it, it changed. So it's an Ouroboros, right? Or two snakes intertwined or an uh, eagle um, eating a snake or a dragon eating its own tail or a dragon uh, sometimes wrapped around you know, in a circle facing a snake is, is the same symbology technically that represents the caduceus, right? The Ouroboros, the caduceus, all these things are uh, emblematic of the same thing, which is, uh, you know, kind of uh, the venom is also the antidote, right? And uh, in the center, you know, the large valley that we have of California is, um, the center of the Ouroboros and it, and the mountain ranges wrap all the way around this, you know? And so it's almost like they're connected. If you follow all the way around down into Hollywood, which would be the belly of the snake one. So it's kind of like the belly of the beast down in Hollywood. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and then it wraps all the way around the Sierras and then comes back down and that becomes the head of, of the eagle. So all of California is kind of like this big Ouroboros, uh, you know, geology. It's like embedded in the geology. It looks like a, a you know, snake creature wrapped around and facing itself, but as the eagle. And that's why the Mexican flag is the eagle eating the snake, right? This wow, used, to, yeah. used to be Mexico, California, right? So there's interesting things that I think are you know, naturally vibratorial, like the reason we get images and stuff uh, that we have, like why our bodies are structured the way they are and why animals are, have, you know, why things have faces and all that. It's something about uh, the geometry of existence. And so I'm not arguing that those are just giant dragons or anything like that. I, I'm arguing that the energy that uh, permeates underneath the geology that was created there made it so that the geology came out looking like you know it, it vibrated to that frequency and that's what they're looking for is that the geology will show them that a certain vibration or frequency is in that area and that's where they need to establish certain things because that also is is the uh the frequency and the vibration of this god that they're looking for, this master builder, because he's one of the dragons. There's two dragons, a double dragon, right? God's a dragon and Satan's a dragon. And they're twins, you know? It's a splitting of, of maybe an original dragon, two dragons, they're twins. Wow. It's crazy. Yeah. Looking at this stuff is amazing. Hey, everybody, tune in to Recent Tartarians. Recent Tartarians. Recent Tartarians.